like start now. Uh, so today we have uh, Anapana uh, Nakshori is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, prior to CSD, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the machine learning department at CMU. Uh, she obtained her PhD from uh, Saarland University, Germany for research carried out at the Max Planck Institute for Informatics in uh, Saarbrücken. She completed undergraduate studies in uh, computer science at the University of Captain, South Africa. So welcome our speaker. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the advanced in a multilingual word embeddings uh, or multilingual word representations. Um, and uh, I have organized the content of my talk into three sections. First, I'm going to define the problem uh, of learning multilingual word representations. And then I'm going to talk about uh, some of the methods that have been proposed. And this will include both uh, prior work as well as our own work. Uh, and then I'll finish off with some of the outstanding issues and uh, the analysis we have done uh, with regard to how they uh, impact performance. All right, so the big picture question here um, is that of how do we learn meaning representations? that computer systems can use to solve tasks involving human language. And over the years, a number of representations have been proposed. And uh, uh, currently, it has emerged that uh, distributed representations uh, are the state-of-the-art representations for words, uh, where the idea is that uh, for each word who represent it as a point in vector space, such that uh, words that mean uh, similar things are, are close together in vector space. So basically, we end up with uh, each word in our vocabulary being associated with uh, a vector. Um, so I don't want to preach to the choir here, but let me say one more thing about modeling word vectors. Um, so they're typically learned by making use of the distributional hypothesis, which is that uh, we can learn the meaning of a word uh, from the words that it co-occurs with. And more precisely, uh, one common method of learning monolingual word vectors is to say um, we are going to try to maximize the probability of any context word given as center word. So if we go through a massive corpus, and then uh, for each word, we treat it as a center word, and we uh, take its context, which is going to be the uh, M words to the left, M words to the right, and then we um, optimize for that uh, expression there. Uh, and the uh, parameterization of that model can be something like a linear model, which is what skip from does, or we can be um, anything you want. It can be a normal form. And multilingual word embeddings are an extension of that in that we are still looking to represent each word as a point in vector space, but we want these representations to be such that uh, words that mean the same thing are close together, regardless of language. So for example, here we have the words called precedent in different languages uh, clustering together uh, in the same region. And that's the representation we want when we talk, uh, when we speak of uh, multilingual word vectors. And there are various reasons to want such a representation. Um, one reason is that uh, we might want to do cross-lingual model transfer, um, where the idea is that it's no secret that word vectors are a key feature in NLP across the board uh, in various tasks. And so uh, if we have a shared uh, multilingual semantic space, then what we can do is that we can have one language where we have labeled data, for example, English, and then uh, we can train a model on that, uh, on that labeled data, and we can apply the resulting model all the languages. For example, if we want to train a um, document classification model, we have labeled data only for English. Uh, we can uh, train a model in English and without doing anything else, uh, use that model to uh, classify documents in German or other languages. And this is uh, useful because of the fact that 
is the disparity in the resources that we have for different languages. For most low resource languages, we have little to no labeled data for many NLP tasks. So this is uh, very useful to be able to do that. And it has already been put to test in various tasks, for example, document classification, part of speech tagging, parsing, and so on. Uh, another more recent application of uh, multilingual word embeddings uh, is the, uh, it's, uh, their role in uh, a neural machine translation where one wants to start with some initial solution and then improve upon it using ideas from back translation and, um, uh, and some ideas from um, adversarial training. And basically here, the idea is to use multilingual word embeddings to provide you an initial solution. So that is the motivation and the problem setup. So let's take a look at some methods, um, briefly starting with some prior work. Um, so various methods have been proposed that require different forms of supervision. Uh, the most expensive one is uh, uh, requiring a word-aligned parallel corpus. So that means we have uh, a corpus where we have pairs of sentences, we get translations of each other. Uh, but also in addition to that, we have word level annotations of which words are translations. Uh, slightly cheaper form of supervision is to say, we can still require a parallel corpus, but without requiring um, word, and, word level annotations. Um, some methods only require a bilingual dictionary uh, without uh, needing a parallel corpus. And lastly, uh, there are methods that are completely unsupervised. So I'm going to give an example of one of each. So this is a method that requires um, a word-aligned parallel corpus. It's a bilingual skipgram, straightforward extension of skipgram. Um, so essentially, the idea is that um, we expand the context to also include uh, the context of the word that uh, a particular word is aligned to. So here, for the word straight, for example, uh, we are going to expand the context to also include uh, the context of its German translation in this case. And so in the skipgram objective, what changes is simply down here, the context, uh, the context uh, becomes larger. Here's a method that is uh, using only uh, a parallel corpus without word annotations. And the idea is to uh, make use of compositional vector models um, and try to optimize for minimizing the distance between encodings of sentences that are translations of each other. So as inputs, the model takes um, a sentence uh, in language A with words A1 through A4 and sentence in language B with words uh, B1 through B3. And uh, there it is that we put each of the sentences into uh, this compositional vector model. This can be simply be a bag of words model or it can be a recurrent neural network, uh, whatever we want. And uh, so the CVM gives us a vector representation of each of the sentences. And uh, this is where we have our error signal and we can propagate the error back to the uh, word vectors. And when we are done doing this for a number of sentences, we end up with bilingual word embeddings. And this is a method using uh, a bilingual dictionary as a form of supervision. And here we're given a small state bilingual dictionary. And the idea is that we're going to learn a map that projects from the vector space of the source language to the vector space of the source. Uh, in this work uh, that goes back to 2013, uh, the map is learned uh, uh, by simply uh, using a least square slots. So X and Y, uh, the uh, monolingual word embeddings of the source and the target language. And we are trying to learn that map here, uh, the matrix M, that minimizes uh, that expression. Um, and when we have a, a new word uh, in the source language, little x here, and we want to translate it to the target language, we simply find the y in the target language that maximizes uh, the cosine similarity between y and the projected vector mx. There are other ways, more recent methods of trying to find 
the, the actual target vector. But this cosine similarity is the basic way to go about it, and that was the one that was proposed in that paper. So lastly, uh, here is an example of a method that uh, doesn't require supervision at all. And here, uh, the idea is that much like uh, methods that use dictionary supervision, the idea is that we want to learn a map that maps between uh, embedding spaces of different languages. But here, instead, we are going to use adversarial training instead of a state dictionary. So basically, we start off by saying we are going to have a discriminator that's going to try to differentiate between the mapped vectors mx and the two target vectors y. And we are going to have a generator, which is going to be the learned map uh, m, that is going to try to prevent the discriminator from succeeding. So uh, we're going to get, try to get the map that's going to try to generate vectors that are as close to the true target as possible, and the discriminator is doing the opposite. And uh, this method uh, here basically runs a few of these steps, and at some point it stops, uh, gets uh, to generate a dictionary of the frequent words, and then refines the map uh, using uh, the same approach as a dictionary supervised method uh, does. So that basically refines the, the, the map um, in the last step. Um, so those are some examples of related work. So here I'm going to be focusing on um, the bilingual dictionary form of supervision uh, because it offers the, a good trade-off between accuracy and the amount of supervision required. The completely unsupervised methods work really well um, when monolingual word embeddings are learned from the same corpus uh, and uh, also when the languages involved are somewhat related. Um, this was uh, shown in a recent ACL paper. I'll also show some of our exer uh, uh, experiments that actually point uh, to this limitation. Um, so you know, when the initial dictionary supervised method was proposed back in 2013, a number of follow-up papers um, proposed improvements on uh, to basically improve accuracy. Uh, one such uh, proposal was to impose an orthogonality constraint on the learned map. Um, so the idea is that we want to be able to preserve uh, the monolingual quality of the word embedding, and uh, imposing that uh, constraint uh, there helps achieve that. And then uh, another improvement I was proposed was to um, use a different uh, loss function than a, than a least squared loss. Here, a ranking loss was used to learn the map and that improved accuracy somewhat as well. So in our work, uh, this is from last year, uh, we proposed an improvement that says uh, typically uh, we actually need a fairly large dictionary uh, for, um, for the dictionary supervised methods to work uh, with reasonable accuracy. So here what we are saying is that if we had a language uh, pair, for example, Portuguese to English, that requires uh, a, where we don't have a lot of labels data, what we can do is that we can do something somewhat similar to bridging, where we are saying that there might be other paths that take us uh, from uh, source language Portuguese to target language English, where we have a lot of labels data. Um, and um, the way we're going to do this is that, first of all, we are going to say, since here we have a lot of label data, we're going to train these two maps here corresponding to the blue uh, arrows. And we're going to train these, and we're going to fix them uh, once we have uh, trained them, because we already have sufficient label data for this. <coughs> and um, here uh, we are using a ranking loss to, to learn these um, maps for the blue uh, arrows here. And the ranking loss is simply saying that the distance between the prediction that we make should be uh, smaller than the distance, uh, the distance between the prediction that we make uh, and the true label, uh, yi, should be smaller than the distance between our prediction and some other negative label, yj, within a margin. And so that's what we use to learn the maps for the paths that have a lot of labels data. Now, we still have to uh, train the map for the black arrow where we don't have a lot of labels data. And the way we are going to learn that is to say um, we are going to have a two-part objective. Uh, the first part is to say, 
for the limited labeled data that we do have for that like arrow going from Portuguese to English, we are still going to want to match the target labels, uh, much like we did in the case where we have a lot of labeled data. Uh, but additionally, what we are going to do is that uh, for uh, the, the other part of the objective is basically to say, we also want the predictions that we are making here with this little labeled data uh, to mimic the blue path, whatever the blue path is uh, predicting. Um, and so that is just essentially saying that we have another constraint for training that black path there where we don't have a lot of labeled data and that the constraint is that it should somehow perform similar to this. And it turns out that works uh, reasonably well. Uh, so for example, here, we are uh, translating from um, Portuguese to English uh, using that additional path that goes through Spanish. And uh, we have a difference of between 65 to 82 percent. And this is an example of translating uh, between uh, English and Afrikaans and uh, using an additional path through Dutch. And here we have a much more modest improvement in accuracy, but uh, there is an improvement still. Uh, here we are doing Danish uh, to English, going through Swedish. Uh, another example where we have a modest, uh, modest increase in accuracy as well. Um, and another place where we thought this could be really useful is when you have a lot of languages that are low resources, but they're uh, related and there are lots of such languages. Uh, and our use case here is the case of uh, Bantu languages. There are over 300 uh, such languages um, spoken mostly in uh, Central and Southern Africa. So, um, so actually my language is also a Bantu language. So I grew up right here. So, uh, so that uh, we're gonna see an example of that language too. Um, but to get an idea of how related these languages are, um, so this is the word for people for various of these languages. Uh, in Zulu, which is spoken in uh, South Africa, it's Abantu. Um, uh, Ndonga, which is spoken in Namibia, it's Antu. Uh, Konyama, which is my language, it's, it's Ovanu and so on. So these are really related languages. So, and so if we have labeled data for one of these, potentially we can uh, use idea, this idea uh, to um, also uh, train models for the other languages. Um, so, as you might know, for limited resource uh, languages, we really don't even have uh, a lot of uh, monolingual data. So here we are uh, using uh, the good old Bible, uh, and that's where we train the uh, word, word embeddings uh, for these languages. Uh, and here we also got the English and the Italian Bible, just for comparison purposes. Um, so here we are showing um, experiments for two Bantu languages only. So we basically want to translate from English to Ndonga, but we have no labeled data for that. But we do have labeled data for English to Konyama, where we have a dictionary of about 2,000 entries. Uh, we also have a dictionary of about 5,000 entries for English to Italian. Um, and what we are seeing here is that um, when we actually use the path that goes through another Bantu language, uh, we are actually getting, this is the blue line there, uh, we are doing much better than if we go through something that is distant as distant as uh, uh, Italian, for example. So you sure. do have an, I don't remember what ND and RD stand for again. Um, uh, ND, ENT, ENT, that's where we don't have any labels data. So, but, no, the languages are ND and RD. Sorry? ND and RD stand for, those are languages. Yeah, those are languages. I forgot what the languages are, but do yeah. you have an ND RD dictionary? No. Don't you need one in order to bridge? Sorry, you're going from EN to ND yeah. via RD. Mm -hmm. So don't, doesn't that mean you need an RD to ND dictionary to triangulate? Um, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, that's a good point. Uh, so the idea is that there are some words that are shared, and so we use that. Ah, yeah. Oh, okay. uh -huh. um, so yeah, it, kind of, it, it does help a little bit. Uh, and uh, so I, I think there's something there. Uh, with regard to these Bantu languages, which are really very low resource languages. Um, okay, so let me um, stop here for a bit and uh, summarize basically the state of uh, multilingual word representations, uh, which is that 
we can achieve a really high accuracy, even in some cases without any supervision. Um, and uh, the issue here though is that this is limited to certain language pairs and for certain uh, language pairings, um, there's still plenty of room for improvement. And um, so that takes us to uh, some of the key limitations and, and then I'm gonna um, present some of the analysis we have done uh, on these limitations. So we started uh, looking at uh, some of the assumptions that are made for our current methods. Um, two such assumptions are, one, that the maps are linear. Uh, and this is an assumption that is made by both supervised and unsupervised methods. And um, two, that the embedding spaces of different languages exhibit similar structures. And again, this is an assumption that is made by both um, unsupervised and supervised methods. So for the first assumption, um, as I said, uh, virtually all state-of-the-art methods uh, make this assumption that the, the method is broadly adapted. On the other hand, it's unclear uh, to what extent this assumption actually holds. Um, and one might say, why don't we just train nonlinear maps? Um, they have been proposed, uh, but they are currently not the state-of-the-art. And as we show in our upcoming MNLP paper, uh, it's kind of hard to optimize, uh, for example, multilayer neural network uh, for this problem. Um, so we're going to take a look at this uh, um, assumption of linearity. And so what we did was to, to devise this simple task of linearity that starts with this uh, hypothesis here, which is that. Um, uh, in contrast to the assumption of linearity, one really expects that the underlying map uh, is nonlinear, but that in small enough neighborhoods, it can be approximated by linear maps. Um, so uh, pictorially, so this is the uh, current assumption, which is that uh, we have a single linear map that uh, allows us to uh, translate with the same amount of, same level of accuracy no matter where we are in the embedding. For example, if you're translating from English to German. And this is uh, our assumption here, which is that one really expects that the underlying map is nonlinear, but that in small enough neighborhoods, we can approximate it with linear maps, uh, these um, uh, superscript XI maps here. So then this is the test, uh, which is that if indeed the underlying map is linear, then the local approximations should be identical or at least similar because we have a finite amount of uh, labeled data. Um, if on the other hand, uh, the uh, map is not linear, then uh, the local approximations will vary across these neighborhoods. So to do this test, we need uh, a notion of neighborhood uh, and uh, we have a simple notion here, which is to say that we are going to create neighborhoods by picking anchor words. Uh, and uh, for each anchor word, we are going to consider only by words to be in its neighborhood. So if we pick the word multivitamins, for example, um, we are going to say words like nutrition, antibiotic, and so on are in its neighborhood because the cosine similarity is greater than or equal to 0 0.5. And words like uh, dinosaur and Copenhagen and so on are not uh, in the neighborhood of the word not. So that's a, a working notion of neighborhood that we're going to start with. Later on, I'll, I'll talk about our upcoming uh, paper uh, on um, automatically generating these neighborhoods. Um, so here is one experimental setup where we basically say, we are going to um, sample a bunch of neighborhoods and we're going to choose them such that they are of varying distances from each other. So here, this is the cosine similarity between uh, the neighborhood anchored at x0 and all the other neighborhoods. Uh, so, and uh, so given that experimental setup, uh, here are some numbers. There's a lot of stuff going on here, but there are only really two key points here. Um, the first is that um, we carried out, um, we generated maps under three settings. The first is that, it's the M column here, 
where we train a single global map. Um, and this is the usual setting where we assume it's a linear map. And then the second setting here is we train a single map, but trained on only on one of the neighborhoods at x0, that's the m x0 neighborhood. Um, and then this is the setting where uh, mxi, we train um, maps on every neighborhood. And one can see that indeed, when we evaluate and on the same map, on the map that's trained on the same neighborhood, one has higher accuracy than if you just train on, um, when you have one global map. And the second uh, noteworthy thing here, which is perhaps more important, is that if you look at this uh, column here, you look at the first column there, which is the similarity between the axis x0 and xi, and this column here, which is uh, actually characterizing the maps, um, there's an interesting relationship. So if we pull up just those two columns, um, what we see here is that there's a high correlation between the uh, similarity between the maps of the second column and the distance between the neighborhoods on which they were trained. Um, so basically, uh, we can see this phenomenon again here uh, in this plot. Um, on the x-axis, we have the similarity between the map trained on x0 and uh, the map trained on uh, xi. And on the y-axis, we have the translation accuracy uh, when we use uh, the map trained on mx0 uh, to uh, translate data from the xi neighborhood. And we are seeing that the most similar, the more similar the maps are uh, to xi, the higher accuracy we get from uh, these axes. So again, just showing the same trend. Sure. Uh -huh. So when you do the translation accuracy, do you know, do you do the per word? Or it's actual sentences that you take the context into consideration? Uh, uh, this is all just at the word level. I see. Yeah, this is all just at the word level. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the context is there to the extent that word representations are capturing context. Uh, but that's, that's it. Sure. Do you think that, <clears throat> so just to make sure, um, when you're actually doing the, the mapping from M1 to M2, that's between two different languages. Mm -hmm. What language are you using, by the way, in this case? Sure. Um, so we did various pairs of languages. So here we are doing, um, I think this was, yeah, this was English to German. Okay. This was English to German. Uh, in the paper, we have, uh, I think, three other languages. And it's just straight, like, we're Devec-ish learning, like you had presented initially. There's no other structure being used for adjacency or anything. Yeah, there. These are from the uh, uh, Facebook uh, text faster. Okay. Um, so I think there's. I don't know if this is like proven or is more lore, but I remember that the, I think the width of your window changes the um, relatedness characteristics. Mm -hmm. Do you know, or have you tried, or do you have any suspicion of whether or not your results would change? If, I assume in this case, it seems like you're doing wide window, right, to get semantic uh, mm. rather than syntactic coherency. Right. Um. I these are really just the default ones that we got, but that's a good point. Um. I think that uh, the I think Sebastian Ruder and someone else has a paper at ACL where they have a bit more detailed experiment trying to sort of study the same. Thing, but so they have uh, different window sizes and different things. But they're they're studying something similar. But uh, we just did the um, off the shelf fast mm -hmm. test uh, for that. Do you have any kind of notion of whether, like, when you were getting things wrong, would they be like, oh well, it's all the right part of speech tag, but the, it's just not a close word or not? Right. Um. And in terms of the error analysis, yeah, indeed, sometimes um, if we are looking at German, for example. Um, sometimes it's uh, the basically the morphology is not the right um, so the, it's not the right part of speech, for example, right. or it can be um, a lot of things. Um, usually, it's something that's almost right but not right. Um, 
So for names, for example, you might get just get another name, but not the correct translation. Um, so we try to basically model other things in the word embeddings in order to try to improve to, to based on uh, on our observations of what the sorts of errors we were getting. We try to, for example, model part of speech tags morphology with some basic um, sort of uh, looking at engrams, inducing engrams to do the representation and so on. And that only improved accuracy by like a point or two. Uh, so we didn't uh, explore it further, but these were uh, things that we did based on the sorts of errors we were seeing. Um, all right, so we think that they're, the, the maps are actually different and they're different, uh, they are varying across neighborhoods and they are varying in this very specific way where they are, uh, there's this um, correlation between the distance between the neighborhoods and the similarities between the maps. And so from what we have seen here, we can conclude that the underlying map is indeed nonlinear. Now, the question is, does it matter? So to answer that question, we are going to look at a, a, the related um, assumption, which is the, the assumption that embedding spaces of uh, different languages exhibit similar structures. And this was an assumption that was um, uh, first suggested uh, by the early work by Mikulov and others in 2013, where they uh, gave this empirical evidence that, look, the numbers in English, for example, the arrangement of numbers in English, uh, looks very similar to the arrangement of numbers to, in Spanish. And um, so here, what we have seen is that for closely related languages, indeed, we have a high accuracy. And it seems like the linear maps are sufficient. Um, and that might be potentially because the isomorphism um, assumption holds in that the embedding spaces of these languages are indeed uh, kind of similar. But when we start going to languages that are distant, for example, English to Russian, there the embedding spaces, uh, the isomorphism uh, assumption might be uh, uh, less true. And so uh, then if you're using a linear map, uh, it might not have the capacity to model the root relationships between such um, embedding spaces of such distant languages. Um, so we can kind of see it here. So these are, uh, two state-of-the-art methods uh, at that time. Uh, and I think what we are seeing here is that, for example, both of them are doing the best on English to Spanish, followed by English to French, then English to Russian, then English to Chinese. This is uh, all on the Fairmuse lexicons with 5,000 training examples and 1,500 test examples. So we think all that we are doing really well on English to Spanish, but if you're going Chinese, for example, this is also really poor. Um, and so what we did here uh, in our upcoming MNLP paper, we said uh, we can try to generate maps which are neighborhood sensitive. Uh, and our approach is to uh, jointly discover neighborhoods while learning to translate words. Um, and uh, where we do this is that um, we're going to try to reconstruct a given word vector uh, by using a, a linear combination of k neighborhoods. Um, and this is a, a simple way to go about that, which is that we are going to learn uh, a dictionary of neighborhoods uh, using ideas from sparse coding. Um, we are going to learn uh, that dictionary of neighborhoods uh, that minimizes the reconstruction error of x. And so um, once we have that dictionary, uh, we can um, have a sort of a neighborhood aware representation of the uh, word vectors. And then uh, we can then use those uh, either to learn a linear map or to learn a neural network um, uh, based map. And here, this is where we saw that you can um, translate uh, if you're using a somewhat shallow neural network. But other than that, if you add more and more layers, it basically becomes difficult to optimize for, and um, it basically uh, gives you zero accuracy. Uh, and this is um, also this was also observed uh, in the adversarial unsupervised uh, tra training methods, where they uh, mentioned that 
their training basically became unstable when they were using uh, deep neural nets uh, for this problem. Um, and using that approach of uh, discovering neighborhoods while we're ready to translate, uh, we can see that we are actually improving accuracy slightly, uh, still not in the in the high 70s, but we're getting, doing a little bit better than the state of the art methods on these Eastern languages. So one might ask, are these actually uh, interpretable neighborhoods? Do they make sense that we are learning here? Um, and uh, here we are plotting them because basically the neighborhoods are sort of the, are vectors. Uh, so we can find which words are close to each of the neighborhoods. And so here's, for example, neighborhood 51, um, where, which, which has things like drug and so on. So it's basically a drug related neighborhood. And then um, 162 seems to be a neighborhood of uh, Chinese names, if I'm not wrong. And then 134 is about crimes and so on. So these are actually somewhat interpretable neighborhoods that we are learning. Um, and another setting where we found that our method, the neighborhood density method, uh, outperforms um, the current state of the art methods is on rare words. So these are the Muse dictionaries. On the x axis here, we can see the word frequency. And it turns out that the Muse dictionaries really contain very frequent words. Uh, so we set up this data set here uh, that has rare words, both in the training and the test set. And uh, what we're seeing here is that, for example, here, we, on the rare words, we are outperforming this method by about 10 points. Um, so that's all I want to say about the uh, neighborhood sensitive method. Um, I wanted to mention another limitation that our current methods uh, are not paying attention to, which is that of the fact that we are learning maps based on these uh, words that are conflated with conflated meanings. And this applies uh, specifically to polysemous words. Um, uh, so, and the idea is that we, if we want to learn this correctly, we really have to do it between sense disambiguated uh, word representations. And so uh, there are various methods that have been proposed to learn sense disambiguated word representations, um, but there are lots of assumptions that we think that are not um, what we want to do. Uh, for example, fixing the number of senses or uh, cutting off the number of senses once we generate a certain number of senses for a given word, uh, I think there was an ACL paper this year which just assumed that for each word we can assume we have two senses. So we are currently trying to, uh, we are working on an unsupervised extraction, a method to uh, extract word sentences from Wikipedia in an unsupervised manner. And our approach is to overgenerate, prune, and consolidate. Um, so and it seems like we are finally getting some reasonable numbers here. Uh, so for example, this is a uh, part of the census for the word rock. Um, so each of the census uh, is associated with the number of sentences. And uh, from what we could see from the sentences, uh, the biggest sense of the word rock in Wikipedia seems to be the music sense. And then there's also the stone sense. Um, so this is uh, the plot of the census for the word mouse. And uh, there seems to be three main senses in Wikipedia, the animal, the device, and the Mickey Mouse. Um, so we are actually discovering not only uh, two senses per word, but it actually depends on what the word is. So it seems to be a uh, very reasonable job. This is for the word bank. Um, here we have um, uh, bank, the financial institution, and the bank river. The financial institution is the larger blob here. Um, and this is uh, bass or bass, depending on the sense. Uh, the fish version is the little one here, and then the music version is, is the bigger one here. Um, and uh, there are words that are just that just have one sense in Wikipedia, for example, beef here. And it seems like our method is also getting that correctly. Um, so that's it. Uh, that I wanted to talk about. Uh, but, uh, we have any um, sure. So uh, in some languages, you know, one word maps to multiple words. Uh, a word in, say, German or so Somali or Swahili might map to three or four words in English, mm -hmm. right? Uh, have you witnessed any uh, impact of these kind of words? Uh, you, you mentioned that if languages are closely related, maybe there's one-to-one -one mapping between the words, whereas 
unrelated languages may have this violate the one to one mapping. Um, right. Have you uh, any thoughts on this problem? Right. Um, the way we tackle that problem now is just that we, at test time we allow um, the the correct translation to be uh, one of n possible translations. Um, in terms of the method itself, uh, at training time, we also allow that one word could potentially map to multiple words. Basically, this is just encoded in the dictionary. Um, we haven't uh, indeed for languages where that um, uh, phenomenon is more pronounced than others, um, where, for example, when you're mapping between a morphologically rich language and um, one that is not, um, that could potentially uh, be a, a, an issue. Um, but I think it's worth studying more when it, it's, it's a great. Uh, another question. So mm -hmm. this uh, embedding for all based on off text, is that correct? You mentioned yeah. off text. Mm -hmm. So which makes use of uh, inside word details like character and grams. Right. Right. So uh, does it actually, is it is it really needed like the sub character representation or can we just go with the one that doesn't look into characters? Right. Um, that's a good point. I think that that is useful for doing some kind of uh, crude uh, approximation of morphology. And uh, what happens is that, in fact, if you use other word embeddings, um, you get about 10% uh, lower accuracy than if you use fast text. So it doesn't to, to matter. Thanks. The last part of your uh, talk seems to be really interesting. So the multi-sense, yeah. uh, are you currently learning it simultaneously with uh, word embedding or because I can imagine you can do it by just clustering? Right. Yeah, you can do it by just clustering. Uh, what we're doing is that we are using the language model. Yeah, so I. I guess you can say we are doing it while we are learning the word embeddings because we are training this language model and then we have this whole pipeline trying to then get to the classes, but it's all in one, basically. It's not done offline. So it's jointly yeah. trained. Yeah, I see. Cool. Uh, uh, as seen in, in one of your slides, you mentioned that there are some similarities between like English word embedding uh, space and uh, another language. And you can see that one, uh, the number one, two, three, four, five, they have a uh, similar positions. Right. Yeah, across different language embeddings. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this one. So, uh, so do you think it's there any research using such signals that the positions between the word pairs? So, as I guess, uh, most of your talk about the uh, works are using like anchor word pairs as the signals yeah but for in your actually in your loss function you can also add this constraints on the some certain word pairs right that you can use the, the a series of word pairs as the uh, the, the 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 loss into your loss function uh-huh um i mean uh, i mean uh, other than numbers, you can also find like some comparative word like uh, good, better, best. Right. Share some similar structure in different. Right. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good point. I think you can add that as an additional constraint on your uh, what you're learning. Indeed. Uh, yeah, that's a great. You can um, perhaps impose that constraint on on, your, on the method you learn. Um, why? Sort of trying to enforce um, relationships between them. Yeah. So for example. Yeah. Any other questions? So thank you, speaker, again.